Okay, welcome to chapter five. Here we're going to be going over DynamoDB in this chapter. That's all that we're going to go over as it is really worth some time to study in the serverless environment. DynamoDB is what's called a NoSQL database. If you're already familiar with them, like through MongoDB or many, many others, then this will come a lot easier to you than it might come to some of you other people that are coming from either no background with databases or relational databases. Relational databases function very, very differently. So if you do have some relational database knowledge and haven't worked with NoSQL databases, I would uh, invite you to just kind of let those concepts go. Uh, we're going to only see a very few of them. Like we still have primary keys, but past that it's, it's quite different. So NoSQL databases are based around the idea of taking an object and putting it into there, or a document as it's sometimes called. In this case, we'll be using Johnson files to uh, track all of our data. And in this case, we'll be using something called DynamoDB from AWS. You could easily replace this with any other NoSQL database. However, I want to stay within the AWS family, and this is one of the easiest NoSQL databases I've ever worked with. So we're going to start in this video by establishing a table and telling it what its primary key is. And we'll take a look through the interface to get an idea of where things are at and some of the capabilities of it. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into DynamoDB. I'm gonna start by going to DynamoDB. And from here on out, I'm just going to assume you guys know how to navigate through. So when I pop over to Lambda or CloudWatch, they're just gonna be opened. We've done this enough times where I think you guys are getting the hang of it. So let's go ahead and just uh, save ourselves that step moving forward. So here we have what you should see if you have no Dynamo DBs installed. If you're using an existing account and you see some in there, don't worry about it. We're gonna create all separate ones so that we don't step on the toes of anything else that's in this account. So for here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a table. So DynamoDB is based on tables. You take a table and you can write information to it. So let's go ahead and create our first table. And we're just gonna call this test. We're not gonna get fancy with it. And we are going to add a primary key to it called UUID. So if you've worked with relational databases before, you'll understand what a primary key is. If not, what a primary key is, is essentially the way that things are going to be looked up inside of your table. So when we store a piece of information into our table, in our case, we'll be storing photos eventually, we wanna make sure that we have something unique that we can pull it up by. UUID has become kind of the de facto standard over the last decade or so. So we're going to be using a UUID and it's of a type string. So from here, what we wanna do is we're just gonna use all the default settings. Actually, let's not use the default settings. Let us um, change the reads and the writes to one. So this will allow us to basically just have um, the minimum amount of capacity that we can. We're going to be using this for proof of concept, so there's not really a lot of need for a full provision capacity or scaling or anything like that. So what we wanna do is uh, set up basically the rest of it as defaults, but we're gonna change these to one. So we'll go ahead and click create here. And the tables can take a little bit of time to create, but while we're doing that, let's go ahead and kinda look through these things. So there's gonna be several tabs here. So there's lots of configurations that you can make. But before we get into that, let's kind of take a finished tour now that all of our tabs are enabled. So this is just some basic information. This is mostly what we set up just a minute ago. So moving over, we have items. And here I've already created some tests in here. This happened while uh, things were off camera, so to speak. So I'll actually go ahead and delete those so that it matches what your guys' system looks like right now. But this is going to be a good place to just go find a record, check it out, take a look at it, delete it. Especially during development, this is a very useful tab. 
Over here in metrics, you'll be able to monitor your system. You'll be able to see how much provision capacity you have, how much you're consuming, even uh, some things around latency and performance so that you can really start to understand like, oh my gosh, I have a really slow query in here. I might need to go create an index to speed that up. Um, over here in alarms, I've gone ahead and deleted the alarms that this automatically created, but this will give you the ability to set up a CloudWatch system that will uh, ping you if your capacity starts getting overdone. Since this is a development system, I know capacity isn't gonna be a problem. Uh, speaking of capacity, here we are. Uh, I'm still in the provisioned free tier eligible one, and I've moved myself down to a very low read and write capacity, but it's plenty for us. In production environments, you can actually set up auto scaling and all kinds of very cool things with on-demand setup. So let's go ahead and pop over to indexes next. This will be something that we get into a little bit later. This is how you create hyper fast lookups if you have a common query, but we'll come back to this. Global tables have to do with taking your data and moving it quite literally around the globe. So this is used if you have an application that's accessed all over the globe. So with CloudFront, we had the edge caching where our website got pushed all the way to the ends of the globe. This will help with that if you have Lambda functions all over the globe and you're using Lambda at Edge and CloudFront and all that kind of stuff and global performance is a really big issue. So this is a really gonna be way beyond the scope of this course, but very, very, very powerful. Next up is backups. I have not enabled them here because this is a development system. Any system that you're going to run in production, you absolutely should turn on backups. I remember a mentor of mine once saying, backups are only important when you need them. So don't be the guy that has a system crash and then you can't restore it because you just didn't push the create backup button or enable the point in time restore. So very important, make sure you set up your backups. Again, beyond the scope of this course. Moving along to triggers, this is much similar to S3 where S3 was whenever you upload something, you can say triggered, or whenever you delete something, go trigger this SNS function or this Lambda function. In this case, DynamoDB works directly with Lambda, but this is a good way to say, when a record is inserted, go perform these additional operations. Additionally, you can also create triggers for when things change and be able to get both the new and the old. We'll take a look at this later as part of our photo cloud application. Access control, this has all to do with security. We're not gonna get into this because we're just not dealing with any of the items from here, but this is analogous to the SNS access control or policy access so that you can say, X, Y, and Z can access my system, but only them. And this allows you to give people access to your database that are outside of your account as well. And tags are a common thing. They're all throughout. This is just a way of naming your stuff. Very useful if you have a insanely high number of resources. Okay, so we've set up our DynamoDB table and we're ready to start developing out the rest of our application. Before we do that though, I'm gonna show you the basics of how to read and write data in and out of this. So in here, we also saw some other powerful features such as the ability to trigger a Lambda function when certain types of events occur. Later, we'll use this in a delete function so that we can clean up the additional resources in our S3 bucket and in any other areas that we have created you know, miscellaneous garbage that would just be sitting around. And we also might want to make sure that this function is part of our privacy and make sure that when a user deletes something, it is deleted permanently and no backup versions are left around. So it really depends on what you want to do with these things, but it's a very powerful tool. So let's go ahead and move on into the next video where we actually start putting data into the database. Oh, 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 oh,